So what are the things that seem most elusive to us these days? Personal freedom, choice, initiative, acting on our own behalf. That's why there's so much polarization because no one can honor where I became split off from my own ability to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And this, we have to go very, we have to go into the unconscious to really get to that place in us. Hey, Joji here. I'm Astrology Hub's podcast producer and an astrologer over at Astrologer Connect. I just wanted to make sure that you knew about Astrologer Connect reading Bonanza Month. We're going to have all sorts of special events, but the biggest thing is that any reading booked in April. So even if you're having a reading all the way in December, as long as you book it this month, you are eligible for a 20% off by using the code April 20. And if you actually go right now, call for an instant reading, you actually get the first 10 minutes for free. Again, this is happening all throughout the month. And to claim your discount, all you have to do is just go to astrologyhub.com forward slash connect and use the code April 20. All right, I'll see you soon. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. We are so happy that you're here, that you've decided to tune into today's broadcast. For those of you who are new to our channel, you have just joined a worldwide astrological conversation that's happening here every single week. We're so happy that you've joined us, that you found us. Today, we're going to be talking about Eris and Chiron and how they are going to be activated by the nodal shift into Aries and Libra that is happening in July. And we have an astrologer here with us today that is amazing at decoding and really unpacking the role of Eris specifically and Chiron in our lives. So what are the themes that are activated when they are activated? How do these things show up in our lives? So I couldn't be happier to be here today with Andrea Michelle. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to speaking about this. Same. All right. And if you are new to the channel and you haven't yet hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, this would be a good time to do that. And welcome back to all of you who tune into the show every single week. So happy that you're here. All right. A little bit about Andrea Michelle before we dive in. She is has been practicing astrology since 2012. She focuses on the poetry of myth and helping her clients find their true soul purpose. She's been a presenter for celebrated astrology conferences such as the Sky Astrology Conference and the Cosmic Intelligence Agency. She has taught for our inner circle and she was amazing. She's also a current astrologer on our Astrologer Connect platform. We're in the final few days of our Reading Bonanza month. So if you're interested in booking a, a reading, now would be a great time to do it. And you can get a 20% off any reading that you book in April. And Andrea Michelle is one of our amazing astrologers who's featured on the platform. So to take advantage of that discount, you go to astrologyhub.com slash connect, and then you enter the discount code April 20. All right. So Andrea Michelle, what, let's start big picture. What's the significance of the lunar nodes shifting into Aries and Libra in July of this year? Yes. Great question. So the lunar nodes shift signs approximately every two and a half years. So, and there's always the, the polarity positions. So we have the north node in one sign and the south node directly opposite in the other sign. We've had the north node in Taurus for the last, well, almost two and a half years and the south node in Scorpio. Before that, we had Gemini north node, Sagittarius south node. So this is going to be a, in a sense, a culminating of the whole astrological wheel because the nodes move backwards, as you can tell from what I just shared, which makes them, it's unusual. They're, they, they move in primary motion, essentially. And they, for me, when the nodes shift and the nodes are moving backwards and everything else seems to be moving the other direction, unless a planet is retrograde, for me, it's a real um, illumination of how involution and evolution are always playing together. So there's always this need to go inward as we go outward. And that's one of the really, it seems, important things to, to consider when we're talking about the lunar nodes. 
Mm, I love that. So we have this this culminating moment, you're calling it, because we're essentially going back to the beginning of the cycle with Aries and Libra. So what does that mean? Does that mean, are people going to be experiencing culminating moments on storylines in their life? Or do you really see this as a distinct move into its own storyline, this Aries and Libra shift? Beautiful. Both simultaneously. It depends on where we're meeting it. It depends on where we're meeting our moment. It depends on where what's being activated, like a, a historical storyline, especially as the South Node goes through Libra, because the South Node is always more of our karmic habits. And the North Node is more where we're venturing into, which is more unknown. And that is actually the territory of Aries itself is to go into the unknown, to leave what we've known behind, the comfort of what we've known, and individuate and come into something completely new. If you have Aries, Libra, node, if you, if you, in your natal chart, if that's your south and north node, is this more activating for you? Totally. You're going to have a nodal return, which is a big, a big time. They happen every 18 years or so. And you can also, if you have the nodes in the opposite sign, so if you have Libra North Node and Aries South Node, you'll be having a nodal opposition that also has a quality of instigating or really kind of coming into alignment with where we are, what we've been doing that's still habits from the past and where we are willing to or available to risk more of becoming who we are on either end of the spectrum. So the North Node always kind of has an Aries quality to it to begin with. And the South Node, a Libra quality to begin with. If you were to just archetypalize the nodal qualities. I like that. That makes sense. And what would you say is the biggest difference between the Taurus Scorpio nodal axis that we've been exploring and this Aries Libra shift that we're going into? It's going to be really interesting because the rulers of the two nodes, for one thing, are going to switch places. So with Taurus North Node, we are venturing into finding more of our sensual nature, our earthly bodies, into our really looking deeply into where we are ready to upgrade our value system, our sense of how we feel stable and secure in the world, in ourselves, pleasure, exploration of pleasure of all kinds. South Node in Scorpio, also pleasure, but it tends to be sexual pleasure. And in the South Node connotation, it can be pleasure of staying hidden, pleasure of where we are not transparent, and the hidden pleasure of the secrets and the manipulation, because there's pleasure in everything, whether we want to know it or not. So Scorpio can be very much where we want to stay, in what's known, intensity. Again, these are more South Node qualities of Scorpio, what's hidden, included, shadow that type of thing. Aries is, again, initiating. It's, it's the masculine um, coming out, coming into something brand new. It's like the fool, you know, the, the brand new, ah, I want to feel myself alive, alive. Like the desire to come into life itself is Aries and know myself and feel and punch someone, whatever it might be, just to, to know myself as alive, right? And the North Node representation of a sign is always more of its elevated condition in a sense because it's new i mean if we have planets in that sign and the north and the node is going through then we're going to be tested in where we have wanted to remain in a certain way in that sign and we're going to be having to get glued in conscious of where we are not wanting to do that sign energy newly fresh you know so there's always that but in its essence, the North Node itself is the higher expression, the unknown expression, the more elevated, coherent expression of that sign energy. The South Node, again, in, in Libra, is more division. It can be polarization. It can be fairness. Really, really staying onto what's fair based on an all like a, a vision of what's fair from my safety habits, not necessarily some like universal idea of what's fair. It's just, it's really more of what's fair to me. It can be being polite or nice 
at all costs, even when I'm resenting you and me. <laughs> so there's still like a scorpionic aspect sometimes to Libra. But it's, and again, I'm speaking of the more south node energies of Libra. But again, polarization, a big one. If it's the, the Aries Libra axis is the first axis of polarity in the chart, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Okay. Fascinating. So we know that that Aries and Chiron are both in Aries. So they're going to be involved in this storyline somehow. So tell us what you're seeing. What are you seeing in terms of uh, Chiron and er Eris's roles in this nodal axis shift and how we're going to feel that in our lives? Awesome. Okay. So they're each on some level, in my estimation, in my experience, having to do with where we want to continue to remain separate in different ways, but where we unconsciously, in our human collective unconscious wiring, are still fighting to remain separate because the coherence of being completely and naturally who we are, all of us, is too coherent for our personality structures, our self-identity structures, which are based in nervous system, karmic, ha karmic habits, how we know ourselves energetically. So we have to, it's almost like we titrate as human beings, our evolution. And it's interesting because even the, the very Aries and Taurus um, archetypes of Aries, like within the, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic fight or flight, right? Knowing when to leave, knowing when there's a threat in the environment. And this, the parasympathetic, which is rest and digest, which is the feminine, which is Venus, which is Taurus. And we are so enculturated to always go, 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 and we don't rest and digest. And I see that partly as a Chiron thing. Because we are wounded in our masculine. Now, not all of us have Chiron natally, but all of us, when Chiron, when any planet transits a sign, there's always still some collective attunement because we are human and we are part of the collective of humanity in our unconscious. We too have a particular Chiron wound or wiring for Chironic wound. So again, if we look at Aries is the instinct to leave the comfort of the known and going into what we don't know, then Chiron wounding can be being cut off primarily from our desire to come more, most fully into life. It's one way of looking at it. Okay. It's also our wounding to personal freedom, our ability to choose, or even our very survival we feel is at risk to take initiative and to act on our own behalf. But again, of all these, the instinct to leave the comfort of the known has been undermined, has been cut. That's where victimization can come in and breathe and become who we believe ourselves to be, metrics based on a victimization rather than a self-assertion, self-substantiation. So, Chiron, in his most elevated aspect, is the sacred wound. So for me, the sacred wound is our connection with both our temporal and our timeless selves, right? The wound is a holographic mandala of the vital intelligence of love. Again, like I mentioned, it's too coherent for our nervous system to know ourselves fully, the the whole process of, of an incarnation for me is to return back to, that's what I work on with the soul and self-identity, to bridge the gap between who we believe ourselves to be and our true soul essence. So the ego has to maintain separation until or unless we have outside experiences that break us open or we volunteer to courageously practice opening ourselves into more and more of our heart love and coherence to hold our nervous systems, our sensations, our habits, or karma. 
And when we begin to situate ourselves at the center of our human experience, our heart intelligence draws back everything we need to heal ourselves, to become more whole in our own endogenous timing. With Chiron and Aries, it can also be, I don't need anything. I don't need anybody. I'm good. Like an overcompensation of the sense of not needing anybody or anything. There's no problem here. I want to make sure I'm understanding because you, you've said some things that are just it's super, super profound. Like, I think I get it, but I'm not totally sure. Talking about the coherence. So it's, there's two, we're, it, basically what I'm hearing is that we're used to a certain level of incoherence between who we really are and who we believe ourselves to be. Great. Yes. Okay. It's, it's what we call, it's how we ne- ne- regulate our nervous systems. But we it's, 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 is it, it's too much information to like, I don't understand where the nervous system comes in. Gotcha. Okay. And this is way, this is a really strong scope here, but it's essentially, we are as humans at this place where we somehow believe in our unconscious, all of us, that we are not somehow, that's what the sacred wound is, that we are somehow separate from what we most love and cherish and value and what is most sacred to us. God, goddess, however we want to call it, and wherever Chiron is in our charts, by house and sign and, and aspects, is that sort of where we feel, feel ourselves to be separate. So that creates the schism, which creates the ego, which believes itself to be separate. But because most of us kind of defer or default to the egos and our ego's sense of safety to know who we are, the ego just wants to remain in what it knows. So Chiron in Aries itself specifically, for me, the wounding that it's not enough for us to be human is one of the pieces of Chiron to begin with. Somehow we are deficient as human beings to do our dharma, to be fully known to ourselves, to be in connection with spirit, to our deepest love. No matter what sign or house Chiron finds itself in, that is one of the cruxes. I cannot get to, I'm unable to get to what I most love and value most. Yeah. That's a fallacy. It's a, it's, a, it's a wound structure. It's a belief system. Mm. And it, it's very, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of devotion and dedication to, to voluntarily access those places in us because it's going to undermine a lot of our ways that we orient to, to life, to ourselves, to, to everything in general. So when, I, when I'm talking about the heart, I'm talking about the level of coherence. It's like... To be able to trust our hearts is not just to put faith in. It's like it's 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 deeply putting faith in ourselves to have us in any circumstance, and to know that we are perfect at any moment. To me, that's one of the most troublesome things about when we talk about the wound is the idea that we are somehow broken. But to me, the wound is a sacred, like I said, a hologram of love, wisdom, intelligence that holds us in just the right. It threads us between the worlds perfectly so that we are not too much for ourselves at any one time. And that our human experience and the life, the, the experiences that we have as a human being in all iterations of the spectrum are perfectly aligned to our unique wiring, our habits, our karma, our destiny, our availability at any one moment. And Chiron is the key. Okay, so Chiron in Aries, then, you're saying that that because of the basic ego desire to keep us safe, that's part of the, the wound, is that even the perception that we need to be safe, that there's something unsafe in some way, right? That Chiron in Aries, because Aries is about going in bold new directions that could be unsafe because they're unknown, right? They're just, they're not, they're not known. Yeah. So there's a unique flavor of Chiron and Aries. I'm 
feel like that I like I'm real close to bridging this. <laughs> it might be me. Let me try this again. The audience is probably like, come on, Amanda, get, give us the picture. But no, no, they're probably like, what is she talking about, Andrea? So, okay. And maybe why this is so challenging is for me to, to talk about is for me, Chiron and Aries is the most difficult to access of all placements because let me give this context. Chiron was discovered in Taurus. So we're coming along 56 years now or something. Uh, Chiron was discovered in 1977 and at Taurus. So we are essentially in the first anniversary, like the Alembic period, the, the womb period of Chiron. Chiron, in a sense, is still hidden to us if we look at a certain rung of the spiral. Mm-hmm. So there's this 12th house quality to Chiron and Aries anyway, no matter where Chiron is in our charts. So it's hard to like access it in that, in that way too. So what is the 12th house? The house of hidden things, hidden enemies, self undoing, and yet also of ultimate fulfillment in union with the divine. So what are the things that seem most elusive to us these days? Personal freedom, choice, uh, things that I mentioned before, initiative, acting on our own behalf. Yeah. That's why there's so much polarization because no one can honor where the original, where I, where I became split off from my own ability to make a choice. Mm-hmm. And this, we have to go very, we have to go into the unconscious to really get to that place in us. It's not something that we can know. That's why it's so scary. That's why it's elusive. And maybe that should be why I'm having a difficult time articulating and why you're like, Andrea, I kind of have this, but not really. Because he's almost like back at his first birthday, but not quite there yet. Right. Okay. Fascinating. All right. So, so because we're going into the lunar nodes of Aries and Libra being highlighted over the next two and a half years ish, these themes of Chiron are that we're, we've just been talking about are going to be activated even yes. more. Okay. Yes. And then also Eris is there. Eris, Eris. is as well. So what's, yes. what's going to add to the pot? Like, how's this going to act to the storyline? Right. Okay. So Eris is, oh, she is conjunct this most recent eclipse at 29 degrees Aries. Er- Eris herself is 24 degrees, but she is, this is the beginning of the period of Eris. I mean, she's been online for a little while. People have been conscious of her, but she's really, this is the uninvited guest making herself known. Okay. And especially as the, the nodal axis moves into Aries and Libra, because she's having a nodal return as well. Her nodes are at 28 degrees Aries and 28 degrees Libra, south node. So Eris, in her lower nature, she's where we continue to perpetuate separation because we've come to believe the story that we are somehow permanently exiled. So she perpetuates, sees the goddess of discord because she wasn't invited to the party and she invited herself, basically. She was not polite company because she said what she wanted. She was unabashed in her love of, you know, the battle and all the things that a, maybe a, a woman or a female shouldn't be. She was the one that no one wanted to invite to the party. She was the inconvenient truth. Okay. So she, again, will perpetuate the sense to know ourselves. We keep perpetuating what we know, even if we know it's going to create suffering. As long as it's something we know, because there's comfort in what we know. So getting back to Chiron for a second here about the wounding of the desire to come most fully into life, Chiron and Aries, perpetuates this constant needing to be separate, keep myself separate. In her fullness, or most evolved nature, Aries is devoted to wholeness or inseparability. Fully liberated, she is the enjoyment of the play of polarity. She laughs at the notions of right and wrong, good and bad. And she's all about reveling in the spectrum of becoming and dissolving. It's a very, very high aspect of Eris. And she lasts, so both Chiron and Eris are both starting a whole whole new cycle with the sun. Both of them back in sometime in, in April. So there's this fresh, this invitation to make a fresh new relationship with these aspects, with all aspects 
of them. And we can't get to the nice ones until we meet the place in us where the, the separation keeps showing up. But the rewards then are a brand new level of the spiral, a brand new, a, a, a more of an intimacy with our own desire, with our availability to make choices for ourselves and come back more fully into life. It's not just an I mean mine without consideration for others, but when we are really attuned to life, we can't help but be doing what is ours to do, which is by its very nature also in collusion or in collaboration with life itself and everything, everyone else in life. Is this making sense? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> we have Chiron bringing in these themes of like, where is our wounding around personal freedom, autonomy to make decisions? wounding of our desire to come fully into life because we're afraid of doing that. We're afraid of too much as we're afraid of unknown, all those things. And then Eris in Aries being activated, these ideas around where we believe we're permanently exiled. Yes. Where we feel like we're not invited to the party, where we're not right for the party for whatever reason we're not included and then i mean i would guess since eris kind of in the story at least of eris eris's response to that was to kind of show that everybody's broken in a way like it's really interesting like it's almost like from a place of feeling broken and not enough eris kind of wanted everyone to feel that way in a way and or was it kind of like it like that idea of 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 them being sort of self-righteous like we're these beautiful gods and goddesses and we don't we do no wrong Mm -hmm. and Eris being like well you know maybe we're all flawed in a way yes yes there's a there's a truth in everything This is the thing. Everything that we do in life is somehow based on wanting to come back home. Mm. It's the distortions in misremembered history, in our own karmic knots, in our own uh, needing to stay separate. Again, this is just part of the human condition. That is the invitation to either continue to perpetuate the separation, even if it's showing others that they're doing the same, that's great. But where are we taking accountability for our place in it? Because that's our default thing to do, especially with Chiron and Aries, is I'll show you where you're wrong, or or I should say Chiron and Aries and Aries and Aries. I'll show you where you're doing the same thing. But where is the account of, that's not helping me get to the deep wound in me and helping me heal. So it's like taking the splinter out of your own eye before you point it out to the other. That's equally important. That's the thing. As we have my children, like when they argue, it's like, well, she did it or she didn't do what she was supposed to do. So I didn't do what I was, you know, it's, it it doesn't seem like the most mature response. Like there, there could be, there could be a more quote unquote experienced way to respond to feeling exiled or to feel left out. I guess my question to you is, what do you see as the as as a higher expression or invitation of this energy? Since you're saying that we we essentially have this next spiral to go yeah. around with with Eris and Chiron, so we we are all being given an opportunity to choose something different in this yeah. dance, in this next dance, and next spiral. So, what would be a more quote unquote mm. elevated e- expression? of these energies. So for me, it's, well, to get to this, Eris is the freedom to be who I am without conditions. Again, the wholeness of me, which includes, wholeness includes all of me, including my shadow. In order to own the freedom to be who I am, I have to acknowledge all the places that I haven't wanted to know me, where it pushed me aside, where I polarized me, Libra South Node and made it about other, where I'm all, I'm good at pointing out the flaws in other people. But where am I not attending to where I am really hurt, where my inner child, my inner exile is hurt, and addressing her 
or mm. him or they, them. It's, it's, it's the coming back to the accountability that it all really begins with me. Remember, the, we started off the involution and the evolution. So as, as we're going out, we also have to attend to the coming in. This is the going out of Aries and the reset rest of the feminine. Mm. Mars, so Mars, Venus. So it's, it's looking at the places we haven't wanted to look because Eris is coming in and she's lifting up the covers or she's pulling out the rug from underneath us. And the more we are allowing ourselves to, to be gentle and you know find a mentor or whatever it might be to help us engage in, our, in the depths of like finding these places within ourselves gently, where this lives, the more emboldened and embodied and powerful we will be in owning and ability to love ourselves in these very, very places where we are still holding on to these belief systems that we are exiled. It's so good. Okay. The other thing I'm seeing too, and would you agree with this, is if heirs is the freedom to be who I am without conditions, it would also be without making others wrong. Yes, right? Right. Like I can see who I am, but that doesn't mean that I have to make you wrong for who you are. Like you can be who you are also. Exactly. That is, that is full heiress in her full expression, meaning shadow and light. Mm. Exactly. Because when we, when we are intimate with our shadow, it doesn't have to come out anymore. We're intimate with it. We're, we're loving it. We are integrating it. it. It's natural life force that it is that's being stuck in the shadow is now part of who we are. So we get to be freely who we are. So very good. Yes. If we are being us unapologetically, then we don't have to make other people wrong. If other people are making us wrong, bless you. I'm going to do my thing. It doesn't, we don't take it so personally. Mm. And I love what you're saying about this, this piece of, um, you know, owning all aspects of, of ourselves. It reminds me of this, this spiritual teacher. Well, this teacher, I don't, she would never call herself a spiritual teacher, but she's a, she's a mentor, a guidess in my life. And she's in her late sixties. And I was listening to her speak recently. And she, she said that in the last few years, she has acknowledged finally that she has a temper. And that she has spent the last 30 years, 40 years, whatever of her life trying to not have a temper, you know, and then all the different practices and all the different healing and all the different modalities and all the different approach. And finally, she's just like, you know what? I have temper. And actually in acknowledging that I have it, I actually finally have choice. I finally can, can, can very honestly just address it and and really you know and it was really cute the way she said it you know and and she's someone you would never even think had a temper like it's like wow that's it's like actually right. it's amazing and and very liberating that she would even say it and, and the way that she said it with so much ownership and actually quote, a lot of lightness it wasn't like you know i have a horrible temper and it was this heavy horrible thing it was just kind of like yeah i lose my cool sometimes <laughs> because I care so much, but but yeah. probably it's not the best way to respond. But this is what I do, you know. Anyways, it was just it was this. It reminded me of that heiress, like just being fully and completely herself and owning all the aspects of herself, including the parts that are not attractive, including the parts that maybe even hurt people sometimes, you know. And and so she's not proud or happy about that. But but instead of you know all the different things she's tried to do to get rid of it is essentially what she's saying. Like, trying to get rid of it her whole life exactly this is perfect you're bringing up the another beautiful facet of chiron aries anger mm. i'm not angry i can't be angry it's wrong to be angry so what do i do i sublimate it and it comes out through manipulation or blame mm. this is what happens when we pretend or we try to to make ourselves believe convince ourselves that we don't have anger we are human beings. We have everything, the full spectrum, whether we know ourselves that way or not, we do. And so you're bringing up an, ama an excellent point because this is exactly what was suppressing our life force. 
how we contort ourselves, why we're uncomfortable all the time. Because there are self-images around us that are very, very unconscious, but we live by them as truth. And we want nothing to do with anything that's going to challenge who we believe ourselves to be. So this is the era of getting honest and just getting down in it with other people who are willing to get down in it. I'm in this workshop this week and it's messy and it's sticky with a bunch of people who are courageously going into the places that they do not want to know about themselves. It's it's not great, but it's held in safety and love. And love for me here means just showing up to what is true. Mm. And so it's exactly what you're saying. The the relief in being transparent that I have a, I have a temper, I get angry, that mm. I, I hurt people, mm. that I hold grudges. This is this is what's going to free. This is part of the opening to the to the freedom to just be more me and to take more ownership and and mature in these aspects for mm. sure. I I use I I admittedly used to think that if things got messy or you know. If it wasn't always harmonious, that there was something wrong, you know, that, that that means there's something wrong. But it's so interesting how some when we allow ourselves to go into these places that, yes, can be messy and not pretty and not, you know, perfectly harmonious and all these things, that there's there's so much energy. Like you said, there's so much life force energy. There's so much to be freed up and then available to us. To actually use in new new ways, yes. Uh, so yes, I love this so much. So basically, what you're saying is that these kinds of things are going to be at for us. Yes, yes, and and it's gonna it's gonna increase polarization the more that we don't want to own or take consideration of where it lives in us. Okay, so when you're saying it's going to increase polarization, you're saying we have a choice to allow this kind of energy to like further divide us from people and make you know sort of like you're right i'm wrong and it's your fault not mine and it's you that i feel this way and all those things or we own it in ourselves if we own these these all these different aspects of ourselves it has the opportunity to bring us closer to and less polarized and less divided correct exactly because when we're blaming and polarizing other people, it's still, it's where we are not safe to acknowledge where that exists in us. Yeah. We have to keep making it separate and it hurts, you know, uh, coming into maturity. We, it, it's, it's not, not that it's not supposed to be easy, but we've somehow been sold a bill of goods and we bought it hook, line and sinker that life should always be pleasant, and happy. And if life isn't, pleasant and happy that we must be doing something wrong and we have to do whatever it takes to get back to some sort of homeostasis and pleasure and happiness. But there's a real, the real opportunity when things are not going well or happy or good is where does that originate? Get to the root of it, which I have to say, I need help doing. I need someone who can help me with my blind spots. I cannot, I'm too... (laughs) good at convincing myself of the story and now I've got this piece or whatever. Less so as I get more honest, but it's, it's, I, I always feel like I, I need someone who is just willing to do this work themselves to help and can hold the space because they've been there themselves of this very deep, these deep places that are really, we have to feel our vulnerability in the places that we don't want to go. It's definitely, well, it's definitely, I mean, they're blind spots for a reason because we're blind to them. So, and and for other people, it can be so easy for them to see it. And so it, yeah. it absolutely seems like it streamlines the process of becoming aware and then to have someone that's skilled to facilitate that awareness and then embracing of is really, really helpful for sure. Andre Michelle, you said something earlier that I just want to ask you a question about. Yeah. You said, not all of us have Chiron. Oh, no, not all of us have Chiron in Aries. In Aries. Ah, okay. Because yes. I was like, wait, but everybody has Chiron somewhere in their chart, right? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. Okay. Anything else that you feel we really need to know about this neural axis shift, 
Chiron and Aries and how this is all going to, like the themes that it's going to bring up for us? For me, it feels like, and what I'm doing for me personally, so I'm just speaking from experience, is to get, to awaken us to our innate aliveness. And I'm going to use my octopus teacher example. So, this movie, The Octopus Teacher, forget that it's just, forget how amazing it is that this man forms a, a relationship with this gorgeous creature, this intelligent, beautiful creature, this octopus. But there was something that he said at the beginning of the movie that has stayed with me and it keeps coming back to me. He talked about how he had lost himself and distanced himself from his family and he knew he had to come back to this place that was from his childhood, which is interesting in and of itself. And he just, to, to heal himself, he had to go back into the water that meant so much to him as a child. And every day he went for a year, religiously, devotedly into this cold water. And he didn't even wear a wetsuit because he knew that even the slightest bit keeping him from being as intimate as possible with the environment of, this, of the water, he didn't want. So he said after a year, his body began to crave the cold. And he said that he found that as he was in the water, like different aspects of his body, of his brain turned on. And he literally felt, I mean, not only did he have the relationship with the octopus, which for me, I would say, if I were to guess, had something to do with the fact that he wanted to have as little between him and the natural world as possible. He wanted to come back to his instincts, which is our instinct, right? The instinct to be in life, to come fully into life, to know ourselves as part of life, not separate from it, not above it, looking down in it, which is part of the Chiron wound. Somehow we're either or. We're not, we can't be fully both. But with this, this movie, what was so beautiful to me is he, he recognized he was a part of this underworld kelp forest which included this amazing octopus, which included even the predators, the sharks, the whatever, everything. He was not separate from it. So for me, whatever we do to bring ourselves back into our bodies and feeling our aliveness, for me, I, I like to go trail running. Sometimes I like to take cold showers. You notice Wim Hof is getting super, super popular. Have anybody heard of him? I'm not, I'm not advocating that people start, you know, taking cold showers. You have to talk to your doctor and all that. I'm not, this is not medical advice. But I think, I feel that there's something with the nodal axis having gone through Gemini, Taurus, and now going into Aries in, in the summer, we're literally being called back into the, the intelligence of our instinctual nature. And we are cut off from the instincts in the mammalian brain. And we are so in our neocortex only, our higher brain. But there's a fullness and a richness to all of us that we've become hijacked in our limbic systems from fear. A fear programming has taken its place. So the more that we come back into acknowledging our aliveness, our vitality, however that looks, that to me is, is part of this, what's going to help bring us into relationship and bump us against the places where we haven't wanted to be alive, where we haven't really wanted to come in, to get more honest so that we can come into the next iteration of where the threading of the eye of the needle is. Because for me, Chiron and Eris are threading us through the eye of the needle, which is not comfortable, but to get us through to the other side. Because Aries is also freedom, the sign of freedom, the search for freedom. Yeah. Wow. That was beautiful. <laughs> that was amazing. Okay, so we're coming back to the intelligence of our instinctual nature, doing things that bring us into aliveness. I, lo I love that and the idea of vitality and what it is to be fully alive. So finding those things. So for each one of us, finding those things. For me, dancing is just like, mm -hmm. that's, that is so, or being in the ocean or, you know, certain things. But so finding those things that bring us into our bodies into a place where we have more access to our instinctual nature so that we can, we can trust it more. We can move with it more. We can actually allow it to be more of a guide for us. Yes. Yes. Oh, exactly. wow. Our bodies are meant to be pushed. 
mm-hmm. beyond our comfort zone. Like when I take a cold shower, I actually get giddy. It's the weirdest That's- thing. Like my heart opens and I get joyful. I don't like it in some part of me, but other parts of me, I'm like, oh my God, this is what it feels like to be alive and tingly in these parts of my body that are been asleep. Yeah. Really amazing. Yeah. Okay. So pushing out of the comfort zone and doing that like on purpose, not having to like be pushed out, but actually doing it on purpose and allowing that to signal to us consciously and subconsciously that we are alive. That we are here, that we do have this opportunity of life right now. Uh And the more we can lean into those uh, uncomfortable places, the more alive we're going to feel. Yes. Yeah. Ooh, I love it. Okay. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you. For those of you who are like, oh my gosh, Andrea Michelle is amazing. I would love to meet with her one-on-one. She is available right now. And now would be a great time to book a reading with her because you can get 20% off, which I don't know if we're ever going to do anything that generous, but we're doing it because it's the grand opening of Astrologer Connect. So this is our official grand opening. Andrea Michelle is available for readings. You can go check out her schedule and find a time that works for you and works for her and book a session. You can do 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, whatever works for you. And um, she's incredible. I've had the honor of having several one-on-one sessions with her and she's She's incredible. She's just as amazing as she appears on this podcast in person. It's even more because you get to ask all of your questions. You get to all ask all of your personal questions and really have her as a person that's holding your hand through all these different tides that we're navigating. So again, that's astrologyhub.com slash connect. And then if you want to use the discount code, it is April 20, April 20. What's your favorite part of meeting with people one-on-one, Andrea Michelle? They're their enthusiasm to, um, it's like there's innocence sometimes in people and so many people about wanting to meet a part of themselves. And it's just so right there and I can see it and I can feel it in them, but they still think somehow it's so far away. So for me to be in that space with them where we can just kind of like relax into, wow, what you're looking for in you is closer than you imagine. Yeah. And be in those places, it's just, it's priceless. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for helping get a glimpse into this Chiron, Eris, nodal axis energy and um, how to make the most of it. Well, I hope it's been helpful. Thank you for your brilliant questions as always. And uh, it's just a a joy. It is a joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate you. And thanks to all of you for being here. Thank you so much for being a part of our community. Thank you for making astrology a part of your life. I look forward to hearing from you. Are you leaning into new discomfort zones? Are you expanding your comfort zone? Are you, are these different things that we brought up resonating with you? We'd love to hear from you in the chat if you are watching this on YouTube or Facebook. And if you're listening on the podcast, we always love to hear from you too. So you can always send us emails at support at astrologyhub.com. Let us know how you're liking the show. Let us know if you have any ideas or suggestions. We make these shows for you. So we want you to love them. And um, we'd love to hear from you. All right. Thanks, everybody. And take care. We'll catch you on the next episode.